how that goes. Okay. All right, do you see one big image? You should. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, again, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I love interacting with Salem Audubon. I love when you guys visit us at the station and it's a pleasure to be giving you some um, results of, of you know, what we're finding out about the birds at Lucky Mute. And so I'd like to start by um, acknowledging my co-author, um, Joan Hagar. Uh, we've been working on this for years now. And as you see on this photo, we have lots of work working on this project. So um, Joan, I'd like to invite you anytime if you have questions, if you wanna answer, um, uh, I mean, if you wanna add information, if you wanna answer questions, please uh, feel free to jump in. Um, I, I would appreciate that very much. And to all the people attending, um, I welcome questions throughout. Um, I like when um, you know the content is fresh and we can build on people's question and add information as we go. So feel free to ask questions and I will answer as we go. And if it gets out of hand, I believe Tim and Harry can keep me in line. So, all right, so this project would not be possible, even though John and I are dedicated, this project would not be possible without the help of all of these volunteers. Um, every single one of them have been at the bird bending station and especially the people with their name in bold. Um, I have learned to be able to rely on these people during the pandemic. So for the past two, three years, these folks have been getting up actually not getting up, but joining us at the station sometime as early as 4.40 in the morning. They're extremely professional, dedicated, and knowledgeable. And I do appreciate their help. And we also have um, an excellent collaboration with a team of partners that are in the, in the box at the bottom. So GP, Kristen, Susan, and Scott, um, um, it's fun to be working with you guys as well. So thank you. So this project has three main goals. The first is education, monitoring, and research. And all of these goals really go hand in hand because without education, we wouldn't have enough volunteers to be doing the work that we're doing. But then the monitoring is also what's um, bringing the data for the research. And the research is what is helping with the conservation of the birds and the habitat. And so these really need to be working together and, um, um, yeah. And for the people, I think, well, I, I believe many of you have joined us in the field. And so if you join us in the field, you've heard me talk about um, bird species, how we age, how we sex, what measurement we take. Um, I love talking about bird mold, but I'm not going to talk about any of that today because these are things, if you want to hear about them, you should come and visit us. This is an open invitation. And like Harry mentioned, he's going to organize visits again next year. And so you're welcome to join us if you want to hear about these subjects. What I'd like to present tonight is more how we're using the data and how these data are helping with conservation of habitat and the birds. Now let me move a little something in my, here we go. Okay. All right. So move on. Okay, so in terms of education, um, I'll talk a little bit about education, but I'll spend most of the time talking about the research and monitoring that we're doing. So we have a lot of different formats for education and we like all of them. The first one, the picture on the left, is that Joan and I are offering a OSU bird bending class. This is a two week intensive in the field um, class where the student gets really one-on-one um, -on -one attention they get to handle the bird, they get to age and sex, extract the bird from the nets. And so this is really a course for people to, um, to have hands-on experience and if they wanna use this skill for their career as biologist. But we also have group coming to visit, like Salem Audubon came to visit us. Uh, on the photo here, we have the Monmouth um, University, a group of undergrad, and this gives them a different perspective. There are usually people that are knowledgeable about birds, or at least very enthusiastic about birds, and they want to see what is bird bending, what are you doing, why are you doing it, but they don't really get hands-on experience like they would with the OSU class. And then, of course, we have the public, which is like a huge part of what we're doing. 
Um, public is welcome to stop by our vending operation, vending station, I should say, and, and to watch, ask questions. And this is something that we enjoy. And, and this photo was actually taken at a bio blitz where we gave a bird vending demonstration. That's where we met Lars, who um, ended up taking an OSU bird vending class. And one of the thing about these demonstration with the public is that often um, have, seeing birds in the hand can have really an impact on people, especially kids. And so I usually am very focused on like bird safety, bird health, getting the data, balancing education with the bird's health. And, and I don't always focus as much on the, on the kids, but like the kids are actually really interested. They sometimes like, you know, I have to like, okay, give me a little space. They're like right here. They, they, they are, um, they love it. And like, look at the kids on the right side and you're at home, you can do this. Mimic his posture, open your arm, open your hand and drop your jaw. And imagine you have a Swinson Strush being released in front of you. I mean, this is having an impact on kids and this is part of our work and this is something we really like to do. So I feel that um, bird bending, having a bird in hand is really a nice way of connecting the kids, the public, everyone with nature. So this is part of our goal. But really our main goal is bird conservation. And, and so we do monitoring and we have kind of two techniques that we're using for monitoring the bird. We have bird bending and we have species checklist. And so just to step back actually, our monitoring is located at the Lucky Mute Landy, Landing State Natural Area which um, is the yellow dot you see on the slide. So it's kind of mid midway between Corvallis and Salem. Um, at Lucky Mute, I'm just gonna call it Lucky Mute for, sh for short. Uh, we've been there since 2018. Um, we've been bending birds um, for five years. I guess we have five years of data. And the white circle is where we originally started. And so we have five years of data for these locations. And then all of the other yellow dots that are like south of it have been added just this year. So we don't have as much data on these locations. So what we do when we bend birds is that we survey for five hours after sunrise, we open nets and we check them like regularly every like, you know, half hour or so. And we do that for three days in a row, once a month. And, um, we capture the bird, we look at their age, their sex, we, ta we take all sorts of measurements, like measuring their wing, their weight, um, sometimes their bill or, you know, whatever, it, dep it depends a little bit on the species. And then we release them, so right away. So we have the birds in our hands like for a very short time. We also take species checklists because some of the birds that we detect on the site don't necessarily go in our nets. So for example, if we hear um, or see raven or birds of prey or um, any waterfowl, we, we don't catch those, but they're using the sites. They're important to, to, um, to record. So we take a little bit of data on both things, um, giving more priority on the bird bending. And one thing I'd like to bring your attention, one more thing is that you see where those yellow dots are is a forest. So I'm gonna show you a lot of air photo and you'll see that not in all air photo, the, the yellow dots are on, on the forest because they, they didn't used to be forest there before. And so um, just something to keep in mind and the shape of that agricultural field because you're gonna see that over and over again, or at least a few times. So here are some of the birds that we're catching at the bending station. On the right side, we have the birds with the highest capture rate. So Swainson's thrush, song sparrow, common yellow throat, black capped chickadee, Wilson's warbler. And, and some of you might say, oh God, a thousand Swainson's thrush. Well, you know, it might get redundant a little bit, but actually we'd love it because it's a huge sample size. That's where we can start really asking conservation and research question when we have a lot of birds. And this is when we start seeing subtle differences between individuals. So it brings actually a lot of, it's really rewarding to catch more and more Swainson thrush. You can ask Joan, every time we have a recapture Swainson thrush, it's like, oh, yes, we like it. But as Harry mentioned in the beginning, uh, it's fun sometimes to have some rarities. It's fun to have something new that we don't catch very often. So on the right side, we have all the bird species that we caught only once with their age, 
and the date that we cut them. And so I'd like to just give you like a few seconds to look at this list. And I'm wondering if there's anything, any observation that you see that you'd like to share. Anything you find interesting or different? And then if, yeah. Don't know that I see the chat, so I might, yeah. There, there isn't any questions in chat right now. Just I'll just move that, forward, that's okay. Anyone in the room have a question at this point? Probably just speak up and Jose can hear you. <laughs> uh, Barbara said that she remembers hermit thrush being ahead of Swainson's, no, being, compared. being compared with Swainson's. So we do catch hermit thrush uh, mainly in September and October. So they, they are not breeding on the site, they are um, wintering on the site. And they are slightly smaller than Swenson's thrush. They have that rufous patch on the lower back. Um, otherwise, they, they look very, very similar. And so uh, we do catch both. And we catch, you know, I don't know. I want to say like, and maybe Lars is going to um, add more information, but maybe two to five every fall, I would say, or maybe two to 10, but not much than that, not much more than that. And then um, Elaine asked about the Sharpie that we caught, uh, Sharpshin hawk that we caught in the nest. And that's, uh, yes, Sharpshin are an adventure. Uh, at the same time, they are not, um, they're not as big as you think they are, like no bigger than a stellar shay. So you just have to be careful a little bit about their talon. And we typically don't catch them very much, even though they are using the site. Um, they just don't, um, you know, you uh, like, I don't know, use the habitat or they maybe bounce off of the nets more than, than stay in the nets. And so we don't catch those very often. One thing I'd like to bring your attention is the date. A lot of them are in, in the fall and a lot of them are young too. And so it is not unheard for um, during the post-breeding or during the migration to have birds that may travel through the habitat but not really use it otherwise. And so I think that could be some of those species. Um, and we have many species that are, are not listed here that we catch, you know, anytime from like um, two or three captures up to like, you know, 100 captures that I didn't list here. We have a list of about 54 uh, species of birds that we catch at the, um, at the station. So a lot more bird species than I listed right here. Um, in terms of the marsh wren, um, we don't, we don't, we hear that bird once in a while and we caught only one, which um, was actually, no, we heard them this year, but we caught it in 2019. Yeah, not a common bird. So I'm gonna move forward now. Um, one of our biggest surprise was this little fellow here, which is a juvenile saw owl that was caught in the north end of the agricultural field at the end of June, June 24, I think I saw, or 25, 24, I think. So this was a huge surprise. We didn't even know they were using the habitat. They were quiet. And um, um, as David Craig, if you ever see him, how he reacted to it, he was ecstatic. It was awesome. And then, whoops, sorry. And then one other species you didn't hear me talk about is that red eye vireo that uh, got us so famous. And for this species, we actually caught di three different individuals. And look at the dates, always end of August, um, early September. Um, this species seems to be using the older forest during the breeding. And so the, the cottonwood, the gallery forest. And then when it's time for the post-breeding time, um, after the breeding, of course, um, they come down to where the restoration happened and probably using some of the, the fruiting shrubs and fattening up before migration. So that's where we catch them, always in that little same area, which is the northwest corner of that agricultural field. So if you're looking for them, that's where to look for them and that's when to look for them. You'll see there's a comment and a question. The question is from Nancy Brommeister. Many of, or the comment, many of these are such common birds, I'm surprised they're not captured more often. Does Nancy has like a species in mind? I think she was looking at the captured once. Yes, yeah. right. Um, yes, uh, you know, we, we open the nets three days per month. And so, 
it, it could be that our timing is just not when exactly they're there, or it could be that they're not exactly where our net is. So there is a lot of things that uh, could play in catching a bird or not catching a bird. And Jose, um, this is Joan. We the the nets are all at shrub level. So like red eye vireos hang out in the canopy a lot, and a lot of those species are mostly above the level of our net, and and that's a reason why we don't catch them. That's Elaine, a very good point. Elaine Stewart says it's interesting that you got marsh wrens in a forested setting, or was it uh, shrubby? I don't remember the exact net where we cut the marsh wren, but I do believe we hear them over the agricultural field more than um, in the forest. Yep. John, if you want to add, go for it. So the reason I mention all the, the birds we capture the most or capture the least is actually not the reason why we ban birds. It's not to like um, documenting the species using the habitat because any birder can do that. Any birder can go in the field and look at the birds and, and count the birds and see what's there. So why are we banning birds? Why, what is it that we're learning from tagging these birds and measuring them that we don't get otherwise? And this is a little bit more what I wanna focus on here, bringing you some piece of evidence about their biology and the quality of the habitat. That is things that we would not get if we did not capture the bird and did some measurement. So let's backtrack though, going back to that counting bird, that's important, like don't get me wrong. This is a map of the trends the population trends increasing, decreasing of Swainson's thrush. When it's red, it means that the, the counting of birds tell us that the populations are decreasing. And when it's blue, it means that the population is increasing. And then the size of the circle is uh, the relative abundance of the Swainson's thrush. So this is one example. Um, and this is for this area. So around here, we can see that we have a lot of Swainson's thrush but the population is really decreasing. So we have that piece of information about the population from counting the birds. This is the Swainsons. Now you see the uh, red eye vireo, and I believe the middle blue dot is representing lucky mute, which is really cool that the Cornell trends are actually detecting the changes at that site. Um, I find that super cool. But um, so, so we get from the count, the, you know, if the population is increasing, stable and increasing, but counting bird doesn't really tell us why are these population changing? Why are they increasing or decreasing? What is it that they're doing right? They, meaning like, you know, are they surviving? Are they reproducing? Uh, are they healthy? This is what the bending is gonna bring us, the survival, reproduction and health of the birds, information about those things. So. I'd like now to focus a little bit more about um, habitat quality because our monitoring is at a restoration site. So we really would like to know, is this restoration site helping the birds? And the birds can tell us if restoration is, is doing a good thing for wildlife in general. And so we'll focus on habitat loss, but still have a look at the other threat to birds, just in case, um, you know, it's always good to have a little refresher like cats and chemicals and collisions. So a couple of those subjects will come back at the end, um, actually. So habitat. So first of all, the Lucky Mute and the Willamette River is Kalapuyan land. For hundreds of years prior to European settlement, um, Native American have managed the land and taken care of it. And since the European settlement, we've seen a huge decrease in the forest floodplain along the Willamette River. So the top figure is a simulation of what we believe the Willamette River habitat uh, would have looked um, around 1851. So you see the forest woodland alongside of the water and then upland, you see the oak woodland type of habitat. And then the lower figure is um, 1990, um, how much less forest. So there's like a decrease in the bottom forest by 70% in between these two time periods. So it's it's a huge loss of riparian, riparian and floodplain forests. Um, and oh, by the way, I should also mention that 
this icon, this is Kalapuyan land, I copied, I hope that's okay, from a presentation from Steph Lilbert that was organized by Salem Audubon. Uh, she gave an awesome presentation about an exhibit um, called This is Kalapuyan Land by the Five Oak Museum. So I just wanted to put a little plug in because it was super interesting. And I copied her logo without asking. So it's my little ask for forgiveness. So this is the oldest, and, and I'm talking about land so much because birds are really impacted by what's on the land. They're an indicator of habitat quality. So this is the oldest photo I could find, thanks to Kristen for sharing that. So this is the La Commune State Natural Area, the north section, um, in 1939. That purple polygon is where the, quote, current agricultural field is. So even in um, 1939, um, there was still some forest. So there's, a, there's still clearing that happened after 1939 is pretty much what this photo is telling us. Now, this is July 2000, and we see that there's a lot less forest in Lucky Mute. Those yellow dots are where the nets are currently. So currently there's forest where, where those yellow dots are, but there was no forest in the 2000. These are areas where the Lucky Mute Watershed Council actually did a lot of planting. So you see um, the south end along the river, the whole north side and the whole west um, northwest side are places where they actually did a lot of restoration. And actually they planted the, the, the center field too just recently, but we'll get there. So in 2008, just a little bit of quick history, um, they folks created the Willamette River Initiative. And with that came 10 years of funding. And the goal of that was to support a healthy Willamette River system through restoration and science. And they identified anchor, anchor habitat, one of which is the Lucky Mute. And so Lucky Mute was identified as a site where they should do restoration. And so, from 2012 to 2022. Um, and Kristen, I think you're there. If you wanna add any information, please feel free. Um, the Lucky Mute Watershed Council planted um, over 690,000 native plants. This is an amazing job, over like 349 acres. So they pretty much went from the bare field that you see on the photo to a forest in like 10 years. So, so, and this is where we're catching our birds. So the data are from that area that used to be agriculture. And then once the um, river initiative um, stopped after the 10 years, then a new network was created, uh, created that's called the Nessica Willamette Network. And so they are pursuing, you know, the next series of challenge using a community driven approach. So things are still like, you know, we're, they're still working on improving the Willamette habitats. So this is when we started the bird banding station, 2018. The yellow, the white circle is where we had our nets from 2018 to, and then this year only we added all the other ones just to, uh, um, yeah. And so we typically um, survey from um, April or May, depends on the year, until October. Some years um, there's flooding, we couldn't reach the site or things like that. Or there was like COVID happening and the park was closed. When we can access the site, we're there. This is this year. And as you can see, that agricultural field is now a lot greener. And that's because they planted it last winter. And so while we are documenting the impact of the newly forested area around the park, um, we're hoping in the next few years to um, also document what's happening to the bird communities within that agricultural field. And I see that Kristen has a comment here. In addition, Oregon State Parks did some planting, the older cotton ones and conifers in some areas around 2000, like by the parking lot and along the Willamette. So there's additional planting I, I did not mention that was done um, around, um, yeah, the, uh, in the area. So thanks, Kristen. So from our data, we can see that in this newly uh, planted forest, a lot of birds are actually breeding from year to year. So these are the birds that are, have been shown to breed every single year. And we know that because in the data, um, we can see that we're catching either female with brood patch. And so that means the female have mated 
and, and they have a nest. So for sure they're breeding. Or we've caught young that had flight feathers, wing feathers that uh, were not completely grown. So those could not have flown long distances to get to our net. And so we knew that they, um, you know, they hatched close by. Did you want to add something, John? Okay. Um, so these birds breed every year. And I did not count in there the males with cloacal protuberance, even though it's a sign of breeding. Um, you know, some species, many species actually, they're going to start having clo cloacal protuberance while they're migrating just to get ready for the breeding. So it does not actually mean that there was successful breeding. So these are just species that had successfully bred on the site. And these species are species that have been detected to breed some years, but not all years. And so I suspect that some species like the downy woodpecker and the, and the flicker probably breed there all the time. We just don't catch them all the time. Actually, we don't catch a lot of downy woodpecker. Um, and then others might be um, intermittent. So some of these species are pretty um, nice uh, riparian associated species like the willow fly catcher, the yellow breasted chat, uh, black headed grosbeak even. Um, yeah, lots of these species are nice. And the rented is always a fun one. Now, the rented is a weird species because the male and the female can have a brood patch and a cloacal protuberance. So it's actually impossible to sex a rented, neither by a brood patch or by any means. And so all of our rented are unknown sex, but we know they're breeding there. So not only are they breeding, yes. Oh. Okay. Not only are the birds breeding at the at Lucky Me, but they're breeding every year at the same place. And so this is a male, Swainson's thrush, that we captured 10 times over the years. We captured in 2018, 19, 20, 21, every time in breeding condition and every time in that same net. So that bird is migrating south, going to who knows where, and then bring, go, moving back north and using the same patch year after year. To me, that's a sign that this is um, good quality uh, breeding um, habitat, at least for the St. Swainson Strush. So this is one individual. Um, this is another one that was caught again four different years in the same two nets. And these two nets are really close to each other. So it's, it's pretty amazing that we catch that individual in the same place over and over from year to year. We also have other species that we catch frequently in the same place. These are two uh, common yellow throat that were caught three different years in the same small area. So they just they migrate and come back again to Lucky Mute. Um, they like Lucky Mute. So we see that breeding habitat is pretty good there, but what about post-breeding? Are birds using the, the site at other time of the year? Like we know breeding is really important because that's where the, the, you know, they reproduce and produce all the young. So we need to have good reproduction, but we also need the birds to survive out of time of the year when they're maybe not at lucky mute. And so I feel we need to give more attention to the post-breeding season and, and there's a lot of interest already about migration. So this hand I put there, because to me, that's a symbol of post-breeding because, um, well, I don't wanna gross you out too much, but this is actually bird poop. But the key here is not that it's bird poop, it's because it's purple. And it's purple because the birds that we handled were eating berries. These are berries from berry um, shrub that they planted at Lucky Mute, a lot of native shrubs that, that have berries. So the birds are using the sites to as a stopover to fatten up during the post breeding. And then the photo on the right is um, during migration. It's really cool. I was telling you how Swainson's trush, we start looking at like slight differences. Well, these are two Swainson's trush. And as you see, one is a little bit more olive and the other one is a little bit more reddish. We tend to sometime every so often catch some Swainson's trush that's that seem to be a different subspecies. But again, we don't know where they're from and where they're going. But they are using the site during the post breeding. So to know 
if the site is a good site for post-breeding stopover, I look in our data to see if we had individuals that were captured in the same year in August and September. And I look to see the difference in their weight between August and September of the same year, the same individual. So if I cut them at the site both times, I know that it's the site that allowed them to gain weight if they gain weight. So what I saw is that for resident species like the song sparrow and the spotted toey, um, they stay year round. They don't have to migrate as much. Maybe some do, but um, you know there might be a little bit of loss weight, a little bit of gain weight, but they're pretty pretty you know steady. But what amazed me was that Swainson thrush. They need to gain weight. If they gain weight, if they fatten up during the post breeding, then they have enough energy stored to successfully. Um, complete their migration. So they rely on this to survive their migration. And thankfully, I was able to see that even during the post-breeding, the habitat is providing enough food for the Swainson thrush to be able to gain weight and hopefully survive their migration. So habitat seems good during post-breeding as well. Now, what about wintering? We should not forget our winter birds. This is the Christmas bird count time. And we have a lot of birds that rely on this habitat at this time of the year. And again, as with the breeding, we see that some birds come to a lucky mute for the winter season and they are captured across here in the same nets. This fox sparrow, net number three, um, in 2018 and 21, used the same, same place. And so um, again, it seems that uh, Lucky Mute is being uh, used by dedicated birds, I should say. And the same thing with um, this ruby crown kinglet uh, female um, and another fox sparrow. So is Lucky Mute providing quality habitat to birds year round? I should say yes. And there's three pieces of evidence that seems to support that. First, it promotes um, bird fitness because the birds are reproducing on the site. Two, it allows for pre-migration fattening. So that's, uh, you know, all those fruits that are available and nuts as well. And that's gonna increase survival rates during migration, something that we need. And then birds, regardless of breeding or wintering, are reusing the site um, across years. They have high site fidelity. So this is like, you know, tip my hat to the lucky mute folk. Great job. This is really helping the birds. Now I'd like to change our focus from um, talking about one location year round to talk about one species year round. And in this case, I'm mostly the Swainson thrush because that's the species we have most data about. And if I wanna talk about the Swainson thrush year round, we have to talk about their movement, their migration, where are they going? And that leads me to the MODIS technology. And you know a little bit about this, but I'm still gonna bring um, um, a little bit of information. So first of all, the MODIS network, because it's a network of collabor collaboration, has stations all over the Americas, um, mostly in North America, but they're starting to add more in South America. And anytime a bird has a tag and flies by the station, it's being detected by the station and, and the people that put the tag and the people that own the station get the information about that bird that flew by. And so it really is a way without having to catch the bird to tell us the route the birds are using during migration. And all of those stations are connected. They share the same database. And so really like people know like, oh, your bird flew through my station. So it's really, really useful. Now, as of last fall, um, we didn't have a station in the Willamette Valley. And, um, and I'm gonna give you a little um, background story there um, because Salem Audubon is involved. So last fall, Salem Audubon came to visit our bird banding station. And John and I shared with um, the folks there that we would love to have some motor station along the Willamette because we have some questions. And in that crowd was Harry Fuller. And Obviously, we had planted a seed because Harry, thankfully, just ran with the idea, asked for funding, and got it funded, asked for the right people, and it's installed. Like, this is to me amazing. I want to hire Harry. Actually, Harry, I'd like to have a couple more around the Willamette if you have some time. <laughs> Let me know. Um, it would be great. <laughs> but we'll start with this one. So 
this uh, this one is at the Ankeny National Wildlife Refuge. And so you see on the map on the right side where the Ankeny Motor Station is and where the Lucky Mute is. Those big um, oval circles are the antenna or the area covered by the antenna, antenna, I should say, um, of this motor station. And so at least two of them seems to overlap with Lucky Mute. So I'm really looking forward to uh, tag some birds and, and, and see you know, the data um, that we're getting through the Ankeny motor station. So I think this spring and this fall are gonna be um, really interesting. So thank you, Harry, and thank you everyone that has been involved in uh, getting the station uh, set up. So talking of the movement of the Swainson Strush, this is their breeding range. As we saw me uh, with the trend, um, um, picture before. So we see that they're breeding in Oregon in relatively high abundance, um, also along the coast of California. Now, if you had to guess, how far south do you think they're migrating? Cool. Here's a map. Feel free to add some like country in the chat. What country, the furthest south country, do you think swings and strush are migrating? Argentina. Argentina. Well, Argentina is a pretty good guess. Did you see the, 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 so here I'm going to press play. This is the wintering range of the Swainson Strush. As you can see during the winter, they seem to rely heavily on the peak of the Andes for the wintering habitat. So purple is highest relative abundance. So a lot of them migrate to the highest peak of the Andes and then less of them uh, would stay in Mexico and Central America in general. So let's look at their movement. And when we look at their movement, I'll play it two, two times. Let's look at where, at least for a Western bird, where do you see them moving north? And where do you see them moving south? And you'll see some of them seems to be going through Baja California, um, but then they don't winter there. So they have somehow to go over water, maybe. Um, so here we go. And this is, um, this um, animation is possible because of the eBird data that uh, many of you are providing. So thank you to that. I'm gonna do it again because it goes really fast. It would seem to go over to the Gulf of, Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, that's a question. Yeah, I think some of them goes over the Gulf and some of them goes around. And from what I was reading, it might actually be different by um, the age of the bird, but I could be wrong. I need to reread it. So whoops, here we go. So what we see um, is that, yeah, they're breeding as far south as Argentina, but also Bolivia and um, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. So what are the birds that are migrating through our station, that are going through our station? So this is a graph that shows the month of the year, then from May to October, and then the percentage of the birds that we capture that are young. So in May and June, our birds are mostly the adult because the, the young are not born yet. And as we move on later in the year, we catch more and more young at the site. Now, it's important to know that swings and thrush and typically will lay four eggs. And so in general, a Swenson Strush family would be 66% young. At the site, we catch often over 75% of our catchers are young. And so to me, that indicates that Lucky Mute is actually very important and that birds, especially young birds, might be flocking um, to the Lucky Mute more than the adult. <laughs> But that raised a lot of questions, like where are the adults going? Why aren't they using Lucky Mute? And why are all those young Swainson Strush relying on Lucky Mute in the fall during migration? So um, it could be that maybe um, those birds are 
um, those young birds are coming from like, you know, the Lucky Mute River, the Sentium, and they're just flocking in from close by. Or it could be that some of them are coming from the north and flying through using the Willamette River. And so we could, we are able to get some clue from our data, but also from a modus um, 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 pro project in BC. So I'm going to show you two slides, and sorry, there are like quick screenshot, not high quality. But what you see is that a lot of swings and shrush were tagged by MODIS with MODIS tag in BC. And this is the route from BC that many of them are taking. They're going to go east and then south, more or less. And then we have a couple birds that seems to really like Quebec. I don't know why. I'm from Quebec. No, actually, I should say maybe my parents are feeding too many birds. I don't know. It's a joke. But um, a lot of them are flying east and then south, but not all of them. Some of them are flying from BC south. And we don't see many of them using the Willamette, but we didn't have a motor station in the Willamette to actually be able to detect them. So I'm really looking forward to see what bird and what age, what sex, um, and what time of the year, maybe that's what it is, um, are actually flying south through Oregon in, in the fall. So these are other, um, again, tagged bird. So but what we have in our data, we do have a clue in our data. And thank you to uh, Lindsay Sanders for uh, doing this analysis here. So. To find out if the birds using the young birds or even the adult birds using Lucky Mute are like from the region or from elsewhere, I asked her to look at the wing length of these birds. Because what we know from population that migrates is that a species that have, uh, like, you know, when the individuals have longer migration, they tend to have longer wing. And so in green, we have the birds that are breeding at Lucky Mute. And if the fall birds were all from the same area, we would have the same wing ratio. But what we see here is that in the fall, which is the orange, we get slightly longer wing, which could be a clue actually that a lot of the birds using Lucky Mute in the fall are flying from the north and just have a longer migration and they're using Lucky Mute as a stopover. So in my mind, this is super cool. And we also have another clue that um, they might be using the Willamette as a migration corridor. We had two birds, actually Joan had two birds. The first one, I didn't mention to you, but Lucky Mute, she did some surveys there before we started in 2018. That's why we knew it was an awesome site. Um, in 2014, she banded a common yellow throat in September. And 26 days later, it was captured at Snag Boat Band Unit in Finlay. And so this bird, those two catchers are right along the Willamette River, which is a strong indication that the bird used the river riparian habitat to do th their migration south. The second bird is a Swainson's thrush that was banded at Lucky Mute on September 9th in um, 2014 and caught again on June 13 in Washington. And here, you know, the Willamette River doesn't get up to there, but this is a pretty nice um, straight north-south um, path. And so we believe that, again, that bird probably used the Willamette Valley as a migration corridor. And so this, to me, really highlights um, the value of having high-quality habitat along the Willamette. The Willamette has been highly impacted by agriculture, by urbanization. It lost all of its forests, but thankfully, um, you know, because of people like the Lucky Mute Watershed Council um, and other people that are working at different locations, the habitat is improving. And I, need, I, I do feel that the bird um, needs that improvement in, in habitat. So our next step, John and I and all of the volunteers, hopefully, um, is to continue monitoring because there's still land management hap happening and we can give some feedback loop, um, give, uh, give information of what the birds are telling us. We are really hoping to catch some um, Swainson's thrush and put some uh, modus tag on them. If you know of sources of funding, please feel free to, uh, um, to share that with uh, Joan and or I. Um, we'd be very open. Uh, we, we've started applying, uh, we just, you know, um, yeah. And then uh, 
like I mentioned earlier, um, we'd love to have maybe a couple more motor stations along the Willamette because at this point we have this this one only. I think there's a couple that could be added by Fern Ridge. Is that Fern Ridge, Joan? I think so. Um, and then, a, but we'd like some like close to the Willamette, like along the corridor, um, to really um, prove show that they were using the, the river for migration. And then on the personal level. Um, I'm really interested to see what's the survival of these birds. So we know they're reproducing, but are they surviving? And is there a difference between the survival rate of those birds breeding at Lucky Mute and those birds that are migrating through Lucky Mute? Is, is breeding at Lucky Mute giving them an advantage in survival? And so um, this is one analysis that I have, you know, um, on my uh, list of analysis, but I'll get to it because I find that super interesting. So um, we're definitely hoping to uh, bring more information about the bird communities there. And then as a last slide, I just would like to finish with, um, you know, we all care about birds. We all love about birds. And there's um, seven simple action that we can all do to help the birds. You don't need to be bending birds. Not everybody can do that once you do that. But there's things, little simple things we can do, like make the windows safe keep the cat indoors, less lawn and plant native. That's what Lucky Mew did and it's great. Avoid pesticides, uh, drink shade grown coffee because birds as they're migrating south, um, sometimes uh, and often use shade grown um, uh, coffee plantation as, on their wintering site. And so this is great bird habitat. Use less plastic, mainly you know for those shore, shorebirds and seabirds, using less plastic is great. And watch bird, which I'm pretty sure you're doing already, um, and share what you see. R regardless of the citizen science program, all of them are important. All of them are used by scientists. All of them are used in conservation. And if I was to add an eighth simple action, I would say turn off lights during migration at night. Because birds like swings and Strush that migrates during the night get um, um, this, uh, the word is not distracted, but um, um, lights really negatively impact their migration. So um, disoriented. disoriented. Thank you, Joan. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Any questions? Any questions in the room or on the chat? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. Uh, I'm curious about the measures taken to control invasive weeds. Uh, obviously, I'm sure something was done to start with, but and how that how that went and how it continues measures as they continue. Yes, I know they are controlling invasive weeds because I've seen it. Kristen, if you're there and you want to um, add something, um, you you're welcome to do so because you know about it way more than I do. But yeah. I know they're working on that. I'm going to ask everybody to unmute. So you Scott, can Scott might know as well, Scott Youngblood. Yeah. Okay, I've invited all of you to unmute if you want to use your microphone. Thank you. Right from this computer too. Sort of, but uh, Scott Youngblood is my manager, so I'll let him answer. Yeah, if we get Scott to talk, it'd be great. <laughs> That's my safe reason. <laughs> Sorry, Scott and Kirsten for like putting you on the on a. But people are interested, so um, you're welcome to jump in, or maybe you want to jump in a little later. Or maybe you're having difficulties. Um, we can always come back to you if you want to. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can get mics on in another way too. Here we go. There's Scott. Oh, did that finally work? Yeah. Yes. Hey, sorry, sorry. We were. I think Kristen and Austin. Neither one of us came off of mute and wouldn't allow us to. So, um, I I would say uh, off the cuff um, that you know we have a great partnership with the Lucky Mute Watershed Council. And and we work really hard at controlling weeds 
really, they work really hard at controlling weeds out there. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, right behind the weed control is planting, which is, you, you know, you, when, when you make a void by removing the weeds, then you got to plant something else. So that's really the strategy we're using out there, really dense plantings, and then, you know, spot sprays where needed to stay on top of the weeds. Is there uh, any irrigation used? No, there's not. And that's uh, part of the planting techniques that are used out there, which is we plant multiple, more stems than you would find naturally um, to allow for that, uh, you know, more plant mortality um, by not irrigating or, and, and they, the plants will thin themselves out. This is Kristen. Can you hear me? Did that work? Yes. All right. Um, thanks, Scott. Yeah. And I would say some would debate even if um, you'd say more plants than fine naturally. I mean, there's more plants than most folks add in restoration, but when, you know, some folks have gone to sites like the gallery forest at LSNA to count woody stems. And when you count all the little rhizomatous growth off of like a snowberry or other plants, um, there's a lot of stems out there. So we start out with lots of stems, small stature shrubs, medium shrubs, tall shrubs and trees to kind of fill all levels mm -hmm. of that space, like Scott said, so that as they grow, you outcompete those weeds. And then so it is, and then also the weed control when weeds do regenerate because they're there, there's a seed bank and Lucky Mute is flooded regularly. So new material comes in often and animal vectors and things. Um, spot spray, periodic spot sprays by um, with chemical use is used. And as the plants grow, the need for that is reduced a lot over time. So it, it is much less than in the beginning when you've got sort of a blank slate, slate and a lot of open space. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks. There, there's a question, Jose. Is there a plant list of what has been planted at uh, the uh, Lucky Mew? Maybe I'll let Kristen answer again. <laughs> there are um, <laughs> 10 years of plant lists. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to share. It is about a 20 or 25 different species that um, get added over the years. Um, so I'd be happy to share sort of just a generic list. Um, it, it would be a bit more work to go back the different numbers over all the years of the different species, but it's typically about 25% um, trees and a 70, 75% shrub uh, mix in part, you know, the, the food source and then also the um, gap filling, kind of filling all that space in the low, medium and high shrub. That was Mary Schmidtgold's uh, question. Uh, Teresa Byrne asked, do you have any idea what percentage of the bird species that pass through our area have been banded and what organizations do host of the banding? So, do, do most of the banding. <laughs> oh, do most of the banding. Oh, God. These are hard questions. Um, I don't have a good feel of the percentage of, was it the percentage of the birds that are captured that goes through? I don't have a good sense of that. Um, my feel is that we don't catch the majority of them um, because we we um, survey only three days per month. Um, John, if, want, if you wanna add anything, go ahead. There's a lot of bird bending that is happening in BC, um, somewhat a lot. And there's a lot that is happening in Northern California, Southern Oregon. So there's a lot more happening um, there and um, a lot less where we are. And I don't know any places that are actually banding birds in, in Washington, for example. Um, to answer the second part of the question, the organizations that are doing most of the banding, I would say that it's mostly bird observatories, like Klamath Bird Observatory does has a whole big banding program and other bird observatories, particularly in the eastern part of the country. Um, and then there's a, a few res researchers such as ourselves that do the banding. All the bands in the United States are obtained through the USGS uh, bird banding lab. So they um, oversee all the banding operations. 
Um, the percentage of birds that come through that are banded is going to be very small, but it's not a question that we can answer with our data because we don't know the total number of birds, but that's a good question. Yeah, I'd love to have the answer. And, and by the way, um, the, the, when we talk about number of birds banded who bends them, we're talking about passerine. But um, I am pretty sure that most of the bears that are banded are actually waterfowl. Um, but that's not what um, you know, John and I do. That's not what the bird observatories in general do. We focus more on passerine songbirds. But bending the waterfowl is very important because actually that's what is being used to uh, set the bag, hunting bag limits. So it's very good information that is um, obtained from uh, bending waterfowl. Are there any dusky geese that uh, winter at Lucky Mute? We don't band past October and we start in April. So I actually don't know that answer. Do you know, Joan, or maybe Molly and, or Lars would know? Molly might know. Oh, I'll have to unmute her. <laughs> <laughs> We're a team. Where are you? There's so many of you. Molly's probably responsible for there being so many of us. <laughs> she um, advertised the link uh, just an hour or so before this oh, yeah. happened. Sorry, I am not seeing Molly. No, she's there. Or maybe Molly, if you want to chat and answer. I have to I have to give her permission. I just I need to find her. While he's looking, I'm just going to add a note for everybody in case people start disappearing. Uh, this will be posted on YouTube uh, within the next few days. So if you want to refer it for somebody or send it to somebody or uh, use it or excerpt it or whatever, or just restudy. It'll be on YouTube pretty quick. Okay, I gave her permission and her mic is on. Here. Hi, Molly. Yeah. Hi, yes. Jeffrey. Uh, first of all, I shared the web link because somebody posted a banded common yellow throat in Salem over the summer. And then his question was, why is anybody banding a bird? And so hopefully they got to join in on this uh, Zoom and learn a few things. And maybe it was even one that we banded over at Lucky Mute. Um, about the dusky question, I think historically they probably have spent time there in the winter. Um, that field along the Willamette would most definitely be a flooded um, wet area that uh, historically had been farmed. And that was pretty typical um, dusky habitat. So switching it now to the shrub and um, trees definitely changes that um, dynamic and makes it a little less uh, hospitable for duskies, but there's plenty of habitat right around there. All that cornfield that we drive by to get in there, I'm sure the duskies um, love all that kind of stuff. Thanks, Molly. Thanks, Molly. You're welcome. We have Alan that has our hand raised and have been waiting patiently. Alan, you wanna ask a question? If I can unmute her. Oh, there she is. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. okay, go ahead. Oh, awesome. So um, I have worked in habitat restoration and riparian and other habitats for many decades, recently retired. What I am pulling from this presentation is the value of really diverse native plantings, plantings that provide floral resources for pollinators through the blooming season, and then all kinds of berries and seeds and things to feed 
birds and other wildlife when they mature, but also, I mean, anybody who knows me knows this is a, a drum that I beat a lot to be really careful about what you choose to control when you do weed control in natural areas because there are plants, Canada thistle and Himalayan blackberry are great poster children for that. They can provide amazing resources for both pollinators and birds. Um, well, as uh, think of them as a bridge until other resources are made available. And um, I just wanted to put a plug in there for being thoughtful about what you plant and what you control. Thank you, Ellen. Um, yes, this is something Joan and I, and, and Kristen, maybe if you wanna add something, feel free. But Joan and I have definitely been um, talking about the balance between um, you know, non-native providing habitat and food uh, versus them being non-native and removing them. And we see the value for birds. And I like what, that you bring, um, you know, the importance that they have, but also trying to bring the native once, you know, um, so that berries don't stop being available, that there's always food available. Thanks, Jose. Yeah, this is Kristen. Um, I appreciate that. I um, At Lucky Mute St. Naturally, one of the things we're trying to think about is long-term regeneration of the native plants. And so, you know, once the noxious weeds have a foothold, um, it's, it's hard, they'll interrupt and disrupt the regeneration of the native plants. It's why they're successful invaders and become noxious weeds. Um, and then also that there's lots of blackberry and other things all around in private properties and surrounding areas. So the diversity is there off the property as well. We'll never get rid of the blackberry all over. So I do feel like it's that diversity is there in the proximity and on site is managing it for long-term stewardship. Um, you know, we don't get rid of all noxious weeds, but do prioritize those ones that will disrupt the regeneration of the native plants in the long term. There's a question from the room. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah. Um, yeah with I, all the, John, with you all wanted to add something? Yeah. Yes, I did. I did want to add something. Sorry, before just before the next question. Um, Elaine, thank you so much for bringing that up really excellent point and i was going to mention that the blackberries the non-native blackberries are super important to the swainsus thrushes i mean if we had that many native blackberries that would be great but most of the blackberries that are out there are the non-natives and the and the birds are eating them um the stain on the hand that you showed jose was probably himalayan blackberry and um so yeah we don't need to get rid of all of it uh it's it's very useful for the birds and i i like that um that thinking about the broad long view elaine thank you yes uh why was lucky you chosen in the beginning why not ankeny right across the river what John, so you want to answer that what question? What was so special about that place? Yes. Well, I think for one, like, so I'll start, Joan, please feel free to add to that. But um, one of the reasons was that Joan had done um, work there previously. So we had kind of a background of data. And two was that it was a restoration site. And so we could actually um, gather data that could be helpful as feedback to um, the land management. So, um, and it had high abundance, high diversity of birds. And um, Joan, you wanna add anything? Oh yeah, those are excellent points. Um, I, um, the, the, it's just a great area. Oh, for one, one thing, the big uh, Cottonwood Gallery forest, there's one of the biggest left along the Willamette river if not the biggest um and in i spend a lot of time out there just walking around and notice a lot of birds a lot of activity and a constantly changing community of birds throughout the year so that's very interesting it being the confluence of the lucky mute and the willamette and with the sandy am also coming into the willamette right across the way there's 
um, just some really diverse riparian habitat, which is always rich with birds. We also, as, as one added thing is that um, we tried to choose a site that was relatively close to Corvallis because of the class that we were teaching and many of our volunteers are from Corvallis. So the closer we could be to Corvallis, that was also a bonus. Might also add just that Ankeny probably wouldn't have the room for the amount of nets we would need to expand with the spacing that we use. Um, it's got pretty good chunks of, of riparian and remnant forest, but nothing contiguous enough that would fit our, our needs. Thanks, Molly. I think that may be all our questions. Thank you very much, Jose and Joe and everybody else. Yes, this was teamwork. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for inviting us again. And um, I'm glad I got to share our project with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job, Jose. <laughs> Thank <on>. you, Joan. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, everybody that added answers. I really appreciate. This is truly a teamwork. <laughs> if any of you did